Oh, lovely, wonderful. So let me just say a very, very, very warm welcome and good morning to everyone. And thank you for taking time to join us. Um, I'm sure you'll be aware that today's session is offered by the Global and Intercultural Ministries Office of the United Reformed Church. And it's building on a previous theme of a recent theme of Do Black Lives Matter in the URC? And if so, what does that look like? What does that mean? So today is the first of two sessions that are being led for us by the Reverend Dr. Peter Crutchley. And Peter is a URC minister currently working with the Council for World Mission in the role of Mission Secretary for Mission Development. So straight away, I'm going to hand over to Peter. I'm delighted to welcome Peter as our speaker, the Reverend Dr. Peter Crutchley, who's going to offer us reflection and challenge on the question of what it means to be white in a world where black lives matter. Peter, I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm going to try and do my share screen join us. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here. And so I want to um, situate this presentation in the reflections of a minister of the United Church of Canada, Adele Halliday. And if you don't listen to anything else, listen to this and reflect on this. I would first implore you, this is we as white people, please stop saying you are not a racist. Please stop only pointing to the overt and outrageous actions of a few individuals and demonize them and say that you are nothing like them without challenging systems of privilege. Instead, please acknowledge that you have benefited from a system of white supremacy in this country and then do something to change the system. Some of us began naming white supremacy and calling out racial injustice long before it was popular. Please also be proactive and do your own work to dismantle racial injustice. It's time to be actively anti-racist. If you are part of the problem, and I am, you are part of the solution. So like many of you, I have been appalled and outraged in the light of the latest episodes of white racist violence, and we've all been rather quick to condemn it, but rather slow, of course, to connect it to the 400 years of white colonial violence that they are rooted in, and that they continue to be manifestations of this. So who am I? Who am I to address this? Let me share a few stories that begin to uh, help with that, maybe. <clears throat> Over 30 years ago, I joined the Council for Admissions Training and Mission Program, living and studying in Jamaica for seven months. Soon after arriving, I was walking along the street and this guy shouted out as I was passing, hey, YT, and I was perplexed because I was trying to work out what YT stood for. Ah, young tourist, I thought, because I was only, what, 20? Mm. Young toff, maybe, that's possible. Ah. YT, of course, and it's true, and it needed to be pointed out to me that I am indeed YT. And in the years since I finished training a mission and lived and worked back in the UK, I was actually able to conceal this up to a point. So I was able to construct an identity for myself based on borrowed Welshness. But when I moved to Singapore to work for CWM, they gave me a number of badges Mission Secretary for Mission Development, for example. But obviously I also became YT again, not young, obviously. I was also more than YT in Singapore. I was also FT, foreign talent, before you think it stood for fat. It's foreign talent, or behind your back, of course, foreign trash. I was also an Angmo. An Angmo is Hokkien word for redhead, and it's a racist uh, form of abuse for a white person. And this actually helped me uh, decide to start dyeing my hair all kinds of colors, including red, because you're gonna call me Angmo, then I might as well have red hair. So I came to this question about who I am, you know, having spent four years living as a visible outsider in Singapore, but because I am whitey, my visibility and vulnerability in that sense were buttressed by white privilege and the wages earned by a whitey foreign trash as opposed to the the kind of terrible wages earned by the migrant workers who live in dormitories and uh, give um, Singapore bad figures for COVID-19. 
So my experience of being in Singapore was not really a road to Damascus, but certainly a road to Dagenham, maybe. And perhaps like many of you who are white, I've treated racism in the past as an extreme feature of poor taste and lack of education, like gold taps or farting in front of the queen. It's the kind of thing that good people don't behave or do. Racism is stupid. It really is stupid but it's also cleverly and deliberately constructed. And I had also subscribed to the view when I left the UK in April 2016, before the Brexit vote, that I came from a country which was proud to be multicultural and had turned a corner in embracing diversity. These are the kind of delusions that we white people live with, right? And June 2016 put an end to that self-delusion. But that being said, I am uncomfortable with my whiteiness and continue to lay hold of my borrowed Welshness as a way to navigate the complexities and embarrassment of being whitey and being British in post-colonial times. So I am in a job which does require some self-introduction um, and some biography and usually I've said when I was living in Singapore, that I'm a mission theologian and a migrant worker from Wales, which is not in England, living in Singapore. But now I'm back in the UK. I'm living in Birmingham. I'm in England. What shall I say now? And in these kind of meetings where friends of mine introduce themselves as black theologians or black liberation theologians, what am I going to say? Can I be a white theologian? A whitey theologian? And can I be a white theologian without that meaning? I'm an apologist for 400 years of enslavement, colonization, and violence. So what would that look like if I could do it? We'll see, but not yet. So I want to begin by reflecting on the only white person who is in the Bible. Sometimes people need to think about this. Who is that white person? You think you know, but obviously it's Pilate. Pilate is the only white person in the Bible. And I want to share with you the, the bit about Pilate that I know as a kind of mirror then for the kind of whiteness we have to address as white people, but as people of all races and ethnicities together. And what little I know about Pilate is based on Wikipedia, so it may or may not be true. But as Pilate himself would say, yeah, what's truth? So Pilate was a military man. Pilatus was a sobriquet, which meant he was skilled with the javelin. Pontius indicates he belonged to the Ponti family who came from Southern Italy. And they had historic and bloody roots in Roman life and politics. Pontus Aquila was an assassin of Julius Caesar. He was also a tribune of the plebs, this suggests the family must have originally been of plebeian origin, of the common order of free people. And in this way, Pilate's family were social climbers who had done well from the system. So if he were a Christian, he would probably be from one of the non-conformist denominations, perhaps rather than an Anglican. Josephus states that Pilate governed for 10 years, which is a long time in the province of Judea, and therefore clearly a creature of the system and a trusted uh, lieutenant of the system, let's say. As Roman governor, he was head of the judicial system. He had the power to inflict capital punishment. He was responsible for collecting tributes and taxes and for dispersing funds and for the minting of coins. And we know him, of course, as Christians from the Gospels, and his place in history is nailed down in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. The Gospels display him presiding over a rigged and politically motivated trial, requiring the convenience of state-enforced execution. And his interest in it all is only piqued when the seditious and subversive nature of Jesus' crimes are highlighted. And he banters with a condemned man about kingdoms and kings, and while a man's life hangs in the balance, mocks the nature of truth. He is alternately depicted as weak and vacillating or jaded and indifferent, 
and his hand washing has become iconic for disdain and passing the blame. What does this single embodiment of whiteness in our Bible reveal about whiteness? And what does it say when that embodiment is not in fact by Jesus, who until recently we had kind of told everybody he's white? Well, we see whiteness in him in toto, as it were. The colonial, military, governing, financial, and legal power all come to rest in his one white body. And this centering of all forms of influence, power, and truth on him is the clearest reflection of what whiteness claims to be and how it behaves as the norm, the power, the truth. So I recognize his and my whiteness in Pilate's so system building and social climbing. Pontius, pleb no more Pilate, is a reminder that whiteness is a system which has deep-rooted, long-standing global ambitions and pretensions to organize, systematize, hierarchalize, and replicates these systems and pretensions endlessly. This is white power, which enforces these systems onto other white people, of course, but especially the lands, cultures, and bodies of non-white people. It's designed to occupy whiteness and blackness and all races between. And to be raised in whiteness is to know our place in a system, society, structure we expect to rise through, not dismantle, which we want to defend and extend, especially against outsiders. You might want to hear the quote of Boris Johnson writing in The Spectator in 2002. The best fate for Africa would be if the old colonial powers or their citizens scrambled once again in her direction on the understanding that this time they will not be asked to feel guilty. So I recognize his and my whiteness in his prevaricating. Pontius, I didn't have a dream, but my wife did, Pilate, lacks the moral courage to act on what is self-evidently the rigged trial of an innocent man. He doesn't need his wife's dream to reveal the injustice of inequality and oppression any more than we needed the dream of Martin Luther King. But he cannot act to betray or confront a system that is his master, and his mistress. And this leads him into the tactic of abstracting people's lives and struggles. Pilate finds time to dangle Jesus over an ontological debate about kingdoms and truth, and to ask, what are the learning points of the statues to men who made money from the trade, rape, and exploitation of human beings, while all the time indifferent to the angst, intimidation, and terror this is built upon? upholding law and order. So I recognize Pilate and my whiteness in upholding law and order at all costs. The moment that makes up the mind of Pontius, I am the governor, Pilate, is when the crowd get nasty. The plebs become restless. So I hope you notice here Pilate's ironic class betrayal. So when the plebs threaten riot, the Done well, pleb, is quick to want to put it down. So action must be taken, and another innocent person of colour is automatically, instinctively tossed to his fate in yet another act of state-sanctioned police violence. And washing. So I recognise Pilate's and my whiteness in his clever and shameless political act, hand washing. Pontius, my hands are clean, Pilate embodies white evasion of responsibility and culpability, which has allowed us to point the finger of blame at our victims, who we have portrayed as unhuman, uncivilized, unworthy. Thus the racists blame black people for crime, violence, poverty, etc., and our system rewards its victims with more of the same. Pontius Pilate is granted a moment when he can act for justice, and therefore, naturally, instinctively, reveals himself to be on the side of the system. And in this is a type of whiteness white people are uncomfortable to own, but people of colour know too well. The whiteness is an implacable, violent, colonial, ruthless system that has self-deluded and self-styled itself as cultured and civilising, but holds to itself the power to judge. It cannot help but keep choosing its own interests even when it is apparently open to reform. In the end, 
I may or may not be a nice white person. I might be a morally ambiguous white person, a cowardly white person, a cruel white person. But if the system remains unchanged, it will yield the same injustice that we are all co-opted into unless we find ways to subvert and derail it. So if we wonder what being white when Black Lives Matter requires, we could ask ourselves, what would Pilate do? Then don't do that. So I want to move to think a bit about a response by white people, having listened and reflected with black colleagues on some of these questions. So what would help us to decolonize whiteness and create practices that would be liberative and not end up in the execution of Jesus and people like Jesus? First of all, know our place. White people like me, this is not going to be news to some of you, I know. White people like me engaging in social justice action have a habit of presuming center stage and then using that place to moderate the claims and action of those whose injustice we're trying to tackle. I, once, I went to Florida, I'm going to digress now, so forget the 20 minutes, this could just go all wrong. I went to um, meet the, uh, a union representing tomato growers, um, Mexican, Guatemalan tomato growers in, um, in uh, southern Florida, the Immokalee Coalition. And the church was very interested in this work because they could see it was radical and fresh and new. And um, they said, we'd like to join. You know, we'd like to support you as allies. And the, the workers said, no, we're not having you in our movement. A, you're not workers. And B, you'll only moderate what we want to do because the bosses belong to your congregations. We need to know our place. Show up, shut up. Listening, hearing, seeing, sensing are critical and necessary habits we need to develop as white people who are fond of talking and not of um, reflecting. And our solidarity then asks us to amplify the calls of black people rather than talking over those people and their calls. So we need to know our place. We need to learn our history. And that's been a con controversial element of recent uh, months and only come back and uh, after all the kind of statue debates, etc., have been taking place here, all about the history we need to know. Now, what is this history we need to know? Uh -huh. Interesting to see. White British people have reconstructed history as if empire was an early form of international development, where we gave from the wealth and wonder of whiteness for the benefit of a world laboring under sin and ignorance in danger of their mortal souls. Outrageously, we particularly pretend that when it comes to enslavement, we were abolitionists, forgetting 400 years of the slave trade before Equiano and Wilberforce came along. Learn our history, see our own struggle, class struggle, the parts that we have played as white people and black people and people of all races together when we have fought for justice in employment rights, in human rights. So whether that's the Chartists in Newport, the Peterloo massacre, the suffragettes, the miners' strike, the poll tax, poll tax marches, many of us come from religious traditions that grew out of a rejection of the status quo and were branded lawbreakers. Christ himself, because a pilot, was put to death for rebellion. So we, of all people, should understand that silence is not an option, that it is violence, and our history can speak and embolden us to speak also. Behave like a brother and a sister and not like a beast. You'll be familiar, I guess, with the kind of abolitionist um, maxim that was used, I am a brother, not a beast. Well, actually, white people, we are the beast. 400 years of organized colonial violence. We are the beast. So let's not behave like beasts. Let's behave like brothers, like sisters. And receive the astonishing grace and courtesy that is extended to us even now by people of color, by our black brothers and sisters to say, we need to do this together. So behave like a brother and sister and confront the racist things that people say and we think. Put our shoulders to push change forward. This is long-term work, but there is a moment here, so we should take it and join in 
and share in it. We should call for reparation and challenge our institutions to invest in racial justice as a sign of their apology. The apology is not enough. We need change and we need relinquishment. We need to show that the, the repentance we feel, the sorrow we feel, is visible in creating change and in the resourcing of communities that have been deliberately impoverished for all of these years. So reparation needs to take place in the international context, in international relations, given the nature of capitalism and how it works. It also needs to happen in our communities in the way that national politics and national economies work. So this is a key piece in, in, um, in this work and C of M is, is trying to name this more strongly and I will say more about that um, in our second um, session that will follow. And as part of that reparation, one of our tasks is to wrestle with the notion of privilege of being white and to put to death the white saviour mentality that led me to become a minister. Decolonize, decenter, diversify. Our institutions and imaginations, systems and streets, minds and monuments, curricula and liturgies, economies and theologies are held captive by certain racist assumptions, privileges, instincts. And we as white people are often all too unaware of this. And remedies in the past have included co-opting black colleagues into the same system to look like we are changing things. But because we are operating with the same presets, the same outcomes apply. So the principles, presets need to be messed with so that liberty of perspectives and persons break into how things work, not just where people sit. So I want to conclude to return to Adele's um, vision and words as we began. Her request to white church and Christians to respond to what is taking place in the Black Lives Matters movement is pray, preach, protest, and repeat. This is not a one thing only. This is a struggle we need to be continually part of. Pray, preach, protest, repeat. And the beauty then, as, as Karen was um, naming were what this whole, these kind of conversations are part of as we're moving at hopefully a church towards anti-racist work and this quote I thought was a helpful thing to have and to bear in mind the beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti-racist anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it including in yourself and it's the only way forward and it's the way forward Christ himself invites. So thank you for this opportunity and a chance just to get to, to, sometimes I don't know what I think until I speak. You will not be surprised to hear that, I guess, you know. So this is a chance. <laughs> and um, the irony of, uh, yeah, letting, saying to white people, you need to shut up. Obviously I don't need to shut up, you know, you get that. So sorry about that, but to share from my, Self and my work and struggle and sense some of these things. Karen is going to send us in a moment into to discussion groups and I propose some questions if they are helpful out of what I've I've shared, um, and uh, we'll wait to see how you uh, engage and develop and how we might respond together. But these are the questions if they help. How do you introduce yourselves? I was interested catching a little bit. It felt like you're a group who already know each other, which is interesting. Um, but if you're white, do you embrace this as your own signifier? And what do you make of Pilate as a mirror to whiteness? And what does pray, preach, protest and repeat look like where you are? I don't think you can deal with all these questions in one go, but maybe you can see what uh, the Spirit does. So, Karen, thank you so much. I'll stop sharing twice. Over much. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. That's sure. really great. Really helpful. So as Peter says, we're going to... Um...